Right. Um, I think we're going to move straight on, um, because time says, to the debate. I know people are sort of shuffling in and out. Um, it's great that so many of you have, uh, have stayed. We've had two fantastic medal, medal lectures. Um, but now we're going to move on to the debate for this year. So this is um, uh, what I want to, to, to do. I'm, I'm Jeremy Tomlinson from, from, from Oxford. And the, the motion that we're proposing is that this house believes that prednisolone should be the first line for glucocorticoid replacement in adrenal insufficiency. So that's our starting, starting point. So what I want you all to do, in contrast to, to, to most situations in talks, is to get your mobile phones out, connect to the Brighton Centre, but to keep them on silent. Okay, that's the first thing you've got to do. So lots of people have got mobile phones. All will be explained later. So this is clearly a hugely important area. You know, there are a small number of hormones that are essential for life, and glucocorticoids are clearly, uh, are clearly one of them. The, the, the natural knee-jerk reaction is that we ought to be replacing patients with the endogenous ligand, but actually there are many situations when analog therapy is perhaps more appropriate or as appropriate or, or better. I think we just don't know. So, you know, clearly in various arenas we're comfortable with that. But actually... What's the evidence? What should we be doing? What are the big issues? And that's what today's debate is going, to, going to, to answer. And we've got really two heavyweights who are really going to be slugging this out um, in no uncertain fashion. So proposing the, the, the motion, we have Professor Kareem Miram from, from Imperial London, uh, trained in, in London, is now Professor of Endocrinology, Deputy Medical Director in Education, and a, and a lead clinician for endocrinology at Imperial a hugely respected international uh, figure in, in clinical endocrinology, both in, in terms of publication across various aspects of endocrinology, his role in teaching. So I think really is at the, the, the perfect position to be able to, to promote the, um, the, uh, the, the, the motion. Indeed, it was his article, perhaps in the BMJ in 2014, that perhaps sparked the debate where he suggested that old treatments are perhaps some of the best. So we have Professor Kareem Miran in the, in, in the red corner, in the blue corner. We have uh, Professor Stafford Lightman um, from University of, of, of Bristol. Again, another hugely influential endocrinologist, again, that needs very little introduction, has really characterized in detail the role of the central regulation of, of, of cortisol secretion, the pulsatility of cortisol secretion, and indeed the clinical effects that that may, that that may have. He's founder and editor-in-chief of neuroendocrinology, a founder fellow of the, medical, uh, of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and again, a hugely eminent endocrinologist, and he will be slugging it out from the, uh, from the blue corner. So, the rules of engagement are very strict, and I shall be imposing them. What we will have is, <clears throat> we will start with a vote, more of which in, in, in a moment. We'll then give each of the, um, e each of the proponents or the, the opposer seven minutes in which to, to state their case. After they've had a chance to, 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 to state their case, we will then have a, a, a panel discussion. We'll open up that then to, to, to the audience. After we've had that, that discussion, we'll then have a, a very quick summing up from the, 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 to the proposer, from Kareem and from, from Stafford, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have the, uh, the, the final vote. So, let's get things started. So, you've all got your mobile phones out. So you can see at the bottom, we're going to do some real-time voting. So this is the thing that perhaps has made me most anxious, because um, these things are great when they work. Um, and what I've got in front of me here is the real live voting. In fact, it's, it's already working, because I can see how many people have voted. So if you've got your smartphone out, go to slido.com. Once you've connected to slido.com, you then put in the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the poll number. It'll come up with SFE BES 2016. If you have to punch in the number, it's 9532. And you'll be presented with that screen on your, on your tablet or your smartphone with three options. You can either be against the motion, <coughs> you can either be for the motion, or you can be undecided. The good thing about this is I'm going to keep this poll live throughout the whole debate. You can't vote more than once, if on your same t unless you've got multiple devices. So if you've got lots of devices in front of you, you can vote multiple times. But actually, if you change your mind, I can keep tracking that at, at, the, at the moment. So I'm going to give you all 20, 30 seconds to connect. You're doing very well. I've got 208 votes so far. That's brilliant. So another 10, 20, 30 seconds, and then I will temporarily ask you to stop voting, and we'll put that, um, that display on the screen to show exactly where we are. So just to remind you, the motion is this. This house believes that prednisolone should be the first line for glucocorticoid replacement in adrenal insufficiency. So this house believes that prednisolone should be the first line for glucocorticoid replacement in adrenal insufficiency. <clears throat> okay, so if I can just ask you to 
stop voting for the time being. Okay, that's great. We've got 339 votes. I don't know if we can display, the, um, display those results for me. Fingers crossed, look at that, fantastic. So, against the motion, 52%. Okay, so at the moment, most people are saying that this House does not believe that prednisolone should be the first line for glucocorticoid replacement in adrenal insufficiency. There's quite a lot of undecided, and there's about a quarter of people that are for the motion. So let me just write that down so we're against, because this will change as we go along. And now my pen's not working, so we're at 52, 24, and 24. Fantastic. Okay, so that's the starting point. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask if we can hide the, um, hide the results. I'm going to keep tabs with that as I go along. Um, but if I can then ask uh, uh, Kareem, to come up to the, the lectern, and you have seven minutes, Kareem, to convince us that we should be prescribing prednisolone as a first-line therapy. Okay, thank you. So off we go. So this is cortisol, and next to it is prednisolone, and the only difference between them is that prednisolone has got this double bond here. Okay? Other than that, it's exactly the same. And what that does is it gives prednisolone a longer half-life, makes it more potent than cortisol, and gives it about twice the binding affinity to the receptor for cortisol. Now, I'll just see another molecule that is another analog cortisol called fludrocortisone. And the difference between cortisol and fludrocortisone is this fluorine atom here. Now, fluorine does not exist in nature steroids, but we stick it in there and we use it as a replacement for aldosterone. We do that because aldosterone has too short a half-life to use practically, and therefore we've got an analog that's not natural, completely artificial. In fact, it's not very good. Its ratio compared to the GR is only 8 compared to 100 for aldosterone. But despite that, we use it because the half-life of the cortisone makes it practical. So my first point is that the half-life of both cortisol and aldosterone are too short for once daily administration. And therefore, using the native compound is dangerous once daily. And we should therefore, for aldosterone, use the cortisone, which we do. And for cortisol, we should use prednisolone because this gives it the longer half-life that you need. The ratios are very similar. So Essentially, cortisol and prednisolone could be used interchangeably if we get the dose right. So the next question I had is, what is the normal profile for cortisol, and is it worth bothering about the ultradian rhythm? And if we're going to replace them perfectly, how many doses should we give? So I found this paper, which basically looked at 10 minutely samples for a whole day from 10 healthy women. And basically, they looked at all the data, and this is individuals, okay? So there's a level every 10 minutes of cortisol. You can see it sort of rises before you wake up. You wake up at 8 a.m., there's a little peak there. And then the level drifts down slowly in the day. I admit it's undulating, but it's not pulsatile, okay? And this isn't all of them. It's a bit up and down, but the levels never come down to zero um, in any of them. If you deconvolve the data, in other words, you mathematically calculate the amount that you make, you'll see that, in fact, you make discrete pulses of cortisol and when you stop making it, the level declines with a half-life of two hours. And you make a big blast up here, and down it comes. So the level of cortisol is always declining, and you maintain it by having a little discrete blast of cortisol secretion. Highly variable, but fairly consistent overall. And I can't help noticing that this particular individual, they all look very similar to this, the level of cortisol rises before eight and then drifts down through the day with little undulations. Very similar to a single as a prednisolone three milligrams. If you have a peak and a gradual fall there, and that gradual fall is given by that double bond there that just makes it hang on and gives it just the profile that you want to replace normal individuals. Now, this is the corticosterone level in a freely moving rat, okay? And in the rat, we have corticosterone, which is not cortisol, and, of course, the half-life corticosterone is very different to cortisol. It's 10 minutes. And what that means is you can have a rise in secretion of corticosterone, and then when you stop making it, it rapidly falls. So this is a true on-off phenomenon in the rat. It comes on and off. But in humans, okay, you have a different hormone. Corticosterone just has nothing to do with the effects of cortisol in the rat. It, in fact, it's a precursor to aldosterone, if anything. In the human, however, you don't have these big falls because the half-life cortisol is just too long. So between the rat and the human, we've evolved to not have pulsile causal levels. Okay, we have undulations. The pulsatility secretion exists, but the half-life is now too long in humans, and therefore we don't see the pulsatility that you see, unlike rats. Okay, and we're human doctors, just remember that. <laughs> okay, so in the freely moving rat, we have these pulses. So what that means is that if your pituitary makes a pulse of ACTH, it's followed by a pulse of cortisol, and then you stop making so you stop making cortisol, corticosterone, and it goes down. And that might have an effect on the distal tissue. So your pituitary controls your adrenal, which controls maybe your brain, maybe it makes you feel better. 
if you're a rat. Okay? But in humans, that does not happen. The levels decline very gradually, just like here in prednisolone. Okay? This is a freely moving human, and you can see there's a gradual fall in cortisol, similar to prednisolone. And because of that profile, this is why we've entitled our paper Prednisolone Replacement Therapy Mimics the Circadian Rhythm More Closely Than Any Other Glucorticoid. Okay? It's published two months ago. Now, if you give a patient a single dose of hydrocortisone, you get this dotted line here, okay? And you'll see the level of cortisol declines fairly rapidly. And if you don't give a second dose, it will decline to zero by about four in the afternoon, and you might have a crisis. So we prevent this by having replacement pulses, in other words, a second and a third dose of cortisol. Very inconvenient. And of course, the manufacturer of Plenadrin have said we should have a slow release preparation that gives you this nice profile here, a gradual fall over time to about 8 p.m., I can't help noting that that profile is very similar to a single dose of prednisolone. <laughs> Gradual fall here. And of course, that costs £500 compared to only £3. Now, we all believe that cheap things are no good, but I can assure you that forget about the price. Okay? It gives you the same profile, maintains the level of activity, and most importantly, prednisolone is much safer. Because if you, let's say you get a vomiting bug, let's say you get norovirus, okay? you need to keep absorbing the hydrocortisone from this slow release preparation, whereas in the prednisolone, it's in there, it's bound, and it carries an action. It gives you that little extra time you need to get to have parenteral hydrocortisone. Okay? Prednisolone is in there, it's just slowly decaying, whereas to maintain this level, norovirus will kill you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, this is a study looking at congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and we all know that in CAH, if you overtreat with steroids, you, you stunt growth. You have a, a side effect. Okay? And, and these guys point out that even multiple daily doses of hydrocortisone do not reproduce cortisol chronobiology. Okay? And they said, let's try, because synthetic glucocorticoids, and they mean prednisolone, synthetic glucocorticoids, they tried a one year period with a single morning oral dose of prednisolone and compared it with hydrocortisone. And to cut to the chase, they found that a single morning dose of prednisolone appeared to be better clinical and hormonal <coughs> control than 30 times daily hydrocortisone. Okay? It, it actually was better growth, a good long-term study. And they found by comparing doses that the ratio is between 6 to 8 to 1. So it's much more potent compared to cortisol. And that means that 20 of hydrocortisone is 3 milligrams of prednisolone, not 6 or 7, 3 milligrams once daily. Now, I've switched patients over to hydrocortisone to prednisolone, basically because they often forget their second dose. So here's a patient who I converted a few weeks ago, and I thought I'd email her. What do you think about it? Do you find three milligrams easier? Dear Fresman, I'm absolutely loving the new medicine, okay? <laughs> and she says, by the fourth, I feel more energetic. And also, if I take three times in the morning, I don't have to work the rest of the day. Whereas with hydrocortisone, I had to think all the time to not forget it. So yes, I'd like to switch to prednisolone, What's the next step? Show it to my GP. Yes is the answer, most definitely. I didn't tell her that she's moved from 2,800 pounds to 40 pounds per annum, okay? That's the cost of a new SHO. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Pitch Foundation, actually, others do say you can use prednisolone, but they've got the dose wrong. Five to seven milligrams per mouth. Now, Paul just told us that 6.9 is too much, and he's quite right. It should be three milligrams once daily as a full replacement dose. We have an assay to measure it now, and some people want assays, so it's possible. The Americans have got it right. They say once daily, three milligrams. So they are on the right track. They go three to five. Five is probably too much. Um, perhaps start with five and slowly work down. So in conclusion... Most adrenal failure patients are on too much steroid. Prednisolone, once daily, the closest mimic of the overall profile, as evidenced by this graph here. We're not rat doctors. And further studies comparing prednisolone and hydrocortisone in humans needs to be undertaken. But until then, prednisolone should be the first line of treatment because it's the closest mimic. Thank you. Great, many thanks, Karim. We will save questions and things for obviously the debate. If I can ask Stafford now to come and uh, come to the podium and um, oppose the motion. What, what, what I think I really want to start by pointing out the potential dangers of glucocorticoid replacement. Even using our optimal current therapy, we know that there's a marked increase in mortality and there's a marked increase in morbidity. And the increase in morbidity increases, includes bone mineral density, metabolic dysfunction, increased cardiovascular risk, and poor physical, social work, and family quality of life. So what we just mustn't do is risk exposing our patients to any increased instance of any of these side effects. 
So what do people over the whole of Europe think? What's felt to be the most optimum therapy? What's a general opinion? And the general opinion is that hydrocortisone is actually the preferred glucocorticoid replacement. And in fact, over Europe, only 7% of patients receive prednisolone. And as we see in this meeting today, only 3.9% of patients in the, in the UK are on prednisolone replacement. So if that's where we are now, what prerequisites would we need before we accept prednisolone for lifelong replacement? Well, I think the things that would be absolutely obligatory is that we have evidence for the dosage we need. We need to know what dose we'd need to give, and we need to know whether or not their long-term efficacy of giving prednisolone, what its long-term safety is, and whether or not there's any increased side effects. It would also be very helpful to know whether there are similar genomic and non-genomic signaling responses between hydrocortisone and prednisolone, and it would also be useful to know whether prednisolone has appropriate interactions with 11-beta-HSD and also the ABCB1 and ABCC1 transporters, which regulate brain and adipose tissue concentrations. So the first question then is, can we actually measure the bioequivalence potencies of hydrocortisone and prednisolone, which Karim mentioned. And for this talk, I, I, I have to simply ignore the major confounding influence of GR epigenetics. I just don't have time to talk about that. So what are the relative potencies of prednisolone and cortisol? Well, if we look at in vitro studies, so if we first of all just look at transactivation studies in vitro, there's a ratio of one point, about 1.7 1 to 1. And if we look at transrepression studies, which is inhibition of TNF-alpha-induced NF-kappa-beta activation, again, there's a ratio of about 2.1. The problem comes is when we start looking at clinical studies. If we look at the relative potencies in causing hyperglycemia, there's a relative potency of 4 to 1. If we look at the relative potencies of causing inhibition of circulating eosinophils, there's a ratio of 6, .1, 6 to 1. If we look at the, core, the increased urinary nitrogen excretion, there's a ratio of somewhere between 10 and 17 to 1. If we look at inhibition of ACTH secretion, it's 4.2 to 1. If we look at growth retardation in CIH, it jumps right up to 15 to 1. And if we look at clinical efficacy in 21 hydroxylase deficiency, it's by between 6 to 8.1. What that's telling us in different diff tissues, in different places, the potencies are different. So there's not one potency difference between them. The potency is going to be different depending on what your endpoint is and what tissue you're looking at. Now, as Karim mentioned, the HPA is very dynamic. And this isn't a rat. This is just a, a Bristol medical student, in fact. And, in fact, it's very pulsatile. He didn't me mention the fact that, the, that uh, cortisol binding protein means actually the free cortisol is probably everything above, above about this level here. So actually, in tissues, when we do microdialysis, it is incredibly pulsatile in man. So it is actually pulsatile in man, so not, not just in the rat. What happens with the pulsing? Well, this is in the rat because there are some things we can't do in humans, but every single pulse of corticosterone in the rat is followed by a pulse of glucocorticoid receptor binding to DNA in blue, followed by a pulse of, G of gene activity. So we actually have gene pulsatility. Your genes actually pulse with each pulse of, of glucocorticoid. Does this actually matter? Well, Becky Comey Cundall has done a lovely study, this isn't published yet, in which she gave rats either an identical dose of corticosterone, either as a constant infusion or as pulses. And this is just a heat map showing you here what happens when you give constant corticosterone or when we give pulsatile corticosterone. You'll see that this is in the hippocampus of the rat. There is a major difference in the gene expression profile. And I'd just like to point out two particular genes this is FKBP5, which is stimulated much more when you give constant rather than giving pulsatile corticosterone. And this is a glucocorticoid receptor, which is inhibited much more with constant than with pulsatile. And both of these are really important for glucocorticoid signaling. So your glucocorticoid signaling will change. But what's this got to do with prednisolone? 
Well, in fact, what, what really matters, it's a very dynamic system, and activation of glucocorticoid receptors by prednisolone results in a loss of physiological DNA binding very similar to what happens with dexamethasone. So if you look what happens uh, with hydrocortisone, it binds to DNA very rapidly and it washes off very rapidly. If we look, look in the rat what happens with corticosterone, it binds to DNA and it washes off re very rapidly. What happens with prednisolone? If you have glucocorticoid receptor activated by prednisolone, it binds to DNA and it doesn't wash off. And guess what? It looks just the same as dexamethasone. And I can't believe any of you in this room would want to give dexamethasone as replacement therapy to your patients with adrenal insufficiency. And since all of it, it there's a lot of questioning here about whether or not pulsatility actually matters in humans, this is a lovely study that's just been done by Georgina Russell. Uh, it's still blinded, so I can't tell you which group is which. But basically, she either gave physiological cortisol. This is to humans, not to rats. So physiological pulses of glucocorticoid in humans. Or she gave the same amount of cortisol, but with a smooth infusion, just like prednisone, which, which, which Karim loves. So this is a beautiful prednisolone profile. Or she gave them their oral replacement therapy here with three, three times a day, each time giving exactly the same dose. And when she did this, she then put them in an MRI scanner, and we gave them a psychological test. We gave them happy faces and sad faces to see what, to see what their biological response was. And in one group of them, you can see you have activation of the amygdala on one side to an, to an emotional response. In another group, you have a massive activation of both amygdalas. And in the third group, just a little bit of activation to the right amygdala. So this is giving the, the, uh, this is giving a normal human pulsatile pattern. It changes the emotional response. And our patients with Addison's often complain that they just feel apathetic, they just don't have the energy, they just don't do things. There's a great in increased instance of unemployment. It does make a difference, the pattern that you see, and prednisolone will not allow you to do that. So going back to my earlier slide about what pre prerequisites would be needed before we can accept prednisolone for lifelong, long life, lifelong replacement, is there evidence for the dosage needed? Well, the answer is no. We don't know what dosage is needed, and it seems that some tissues need more than others. Is there evidence for long-term efficacy, safety, and lack of increased side effects? No, the answer is no. The studies just haven't been done. I'm not saying they shouldn't be done, but the studies haven't actually been done. What would be very helpful is evidence for similar genomic and non-genomic signaling responses to hydrocortisone and prednisolone. They, they're different. They're not the same. And finally, that prednisolone has appropriate interactions with 11-beta-HSD and ABCB1 and ABCC1 transporters. I don't have time to go through this in detail, but just to say that prednisolone is excluded from brain tissue by ABCB1, but it is not excluded from adipose tissue by ABCC1. So that when you get the right dose of prednisolone to get to the brain, it'll be the wrong dose to be in, in your adipose tissue. If you give the right dose of the adipose tissue, it'll be the wrong dose for the brain. So current evidence does not support the use of prednisolone as first-time replacement therapy in adrenal insufficiency. Wonderful. If I can ask both of our um, speakers to come to, the, come to the, 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 the podium, we will begin to open up the discussion. I, I'm not going to sit be, between you, but if I have to, I will. Um, <laughs> please, have, 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 have a seat. I think these microphones should be working. So have a seat here. Make your life more, more comfortable. Um, whilst everyone's thinking about questions to, to, to pose to our, our, our speakers, can I, can I just, um, Kareem, can I just ask, in terms of your approach to... Shorts and actin testing, mineralocorticoid replacement. How do you how do you approach that in patients that you switch across? So it looks like if they've if they've got primary illness insufficiency, they might need a little bit more, so 50 micrograms more fluidocortisone, because of course prednisolone and have a different binding to the MR receptor. Yep. So um, really, looking at potassium and blood pressure are the main things. I'm not I don't measure renin. And, and you you made a sort of big play the, the, the cost savings to that? Uh, if you factored into, um, or the cost savings of switching to prednisolone, what about factoring in the additional testing that you might have to do for, for mineralocorticoid replacement? Does that feature in your sums? So we're doing it already. We're already measuring, monitoring these things. So, so it won't change the cost because we're already having to monitor potassiums and things like that. Okay. And, and, and staff, you know, 
The NHS is, is strapped for cash, and it always will be. Um, shouldn't we be doing this? Now, what, the society, what the society needs to be doing is putting a lot of pressure to reduce the cost of hydrocortisone. That's what the society should be doing. Okay, let me open this up. Feel free. This is um, it, it's an important discussion that we need to have here. So feel free to come to the microphones, raise your uh, to, to raise some important issues, um, and we'll we'll see how far the discussion takes us. We've got about ten minutes. In the meantime, the voting is still open. I'm tracking progress. I'm not going to spoil the surprise, um, but the voting is still open. If you change your mind, you can vote, um, and and your 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 switch will be recorded. Question: Microphone two. Araban Zare from. Imperial Health. A comment to both of you. When we replace uh, thyroid hormones for, th for myxedema, we monitor it by measuring TSH or normalize the TSH. And the requirement of thyroxine varies something between 25 micrograms up to 150. Now, when you actually, and they, I'm sure the cortisol requirement varies from patient to patient, according to age, sex, body mass index, activity, possibly the amount of stress, physical or psychological. So there's a big varied requirement per patient. Yet, you both use a arbitrary day curve to actually try to monitor the patient's dose. And that, that doesn't make sense to me. If you showed me an integrated 24-hour ACTH level to know what dose you are actually giving, I might be convinced. But at the moment, you're both wrong. This is <laughs> <laughs> Kareem, do you want to start with that one? Okay, so, so I find ACTH unhelpful because it's very pulsatile, and if you try to suppress the ACTH, you end up with a very large dose of any steroid. Um, and do always cause Cushing. So I don't find ACH helpful, helpful at all. I agree, I think day curves aren't necessary, but people want them. That, I, I found I couldn't cover anyone to prednisolone without day curve data. So we generated an assay for it, and now we can do that. I don't think it's necessary. I think patient symptoms, I mean, we need to do a proper randomized trial of prednisolone versus hydrocortisone. I think that would be helpful, looking at symptoms and other markers. I accept there's lots of different variances, but I have to say that um, in terms of discussing the point that um, we haven't got data on prednisolone. We haven't got it on hydrocortisone either. We have no evidence that the dose we're giving is right. We're just making up 1055. I mean, that's a bizarre um, random number. Stafford, do you want to? Uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we agree, which is a real problem. <laughs> it is allowed. <laughs> it, um, it's allowed. I mean, wait, ACTH come, is just a useless, it's a useless way of Yo, measuring. And everybody who's done it lands out giving too much, too high a dose of glucocorticoid. It's absolutely standard. But we heard from the day lecture, you're actually overdosing. By the way you're doing it, you're going to substantially sort of overdose uh, quite a number of patients because you have no, you have no feedback uh, on how much to actually give. Now, I'd like to make a suggestion to both of you. It doesn't matter which one you use. I think it's best to just monitor the patient's requirements according to a health score or a well-being score rather well, than I think you'll you have a pro few problems there. <laughs> you'll have a few problems. There's a lot of problems down that line, I'm afraid. Uh, that's much more accurate than what you're actually doing now. And basically, I think occasionally just do a basal, a pre-dose ACTH. And if it's suppressed, you're overdosing. Okay. Paul. So, um, so I think Stafford makes a very good point in terms of the policy end of the society, that it is really appalling in the last few years how hydrocortisone has gone up from about 13 pence a month to you know, what's now X thousand pounds a year. It's exactly the same procedure. You know, it, it, it's the whole generic uh, industry that's taken over, and we've got to somehow call a halt to that. So I think that's a good point. I think the bit that's in, essentially in this where I do support the last speaker, you know, cortisol secretion rate is so variable amongst each of us in this room that it's varying from anything between about four or five milligrams a day up to 17, 18 milligrams per day. And whilst we as a community are great at saying whether someone's insufficient or great at telling them whether they're over, we have no markers whatsoever for the real issue, which is glucocorticoid sufficiency. The bit I like about prednisone, prednisolone, and I'm just going to explore Karim's, is because you do have the one milligram tablet, you can tinker around a little bit more around what we presume to be 
to be normal secretion. And I just wonder, Karim, as I'm no experience with this, whether you, you know, how often you, you've done that. So you sort start off at three, but presumably you might have people on anything, if the analogy is there, from one to seven. And have you tried to do that within, and does it make any difference? Well, we have with individuals, and in fact, I've got a couple of patients on two milligrams once a day, and we measure levels because I'm a bit nervous of, of an acting crisis, and, and there are definitely people who are very slow metabolizers, and two milligrams hangs around for quite a long time. So I've got a range of two. No one's over five. Five is the top dose that gives you a quite high level late in the evening. John. Uh, thank you both very much. I, I, I found both of your talks very uh, convincing. <laughs> both? <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we should have Karim's uh, again, just to level things up. Uh, but I have a question for you, Karim, and it re relates to the emergency treatments, sick day rules... Do you give your patients instructions on using prednisolone or do you give them pocketfuls of hydrocortisone? And what is the injectable rescue that you advise them on? And finally, is prednisolone absorbed absolutely as rapidly as hydrocortisone? So I have a lot, of, a lot of day curves showing very rapid absorption at the start. And there's quite a few posters out here looking at different patients and different groups of patients with food and without food and after food. And it seems it's very rapid in terms of absorption of prednisolone um, compared to hydrocortisone. So if you ha for, for patients having a crisis, we do two things. We either advise them to take 10 of prednisolone, but if they do that, they really need to have parenteral hydrocortisone. So I'm not messing around with, with oral attempts to try and rescue them, they need to have parenteral. That applies to oral hydrocortisone too. I mean, when you have norovirus, you need an injection of hydrocortisone, and that's a really important message you've got to get out there. There is no parenteral preparation that we can really use of a prednisone, so we just go for in injectable hydrocortisone. Interestingly, that's quite cheap compared to the oral. It's just the tablet is expensive. I am hydrocortisone. This is really cheap. Thanks for that clarification. John. Can I say something about the cost of drugs? Because Kareem and I have been writing to a lot of different people around the country. Uh, and in fact, there was a campaign in the Times, which some of you might have read, which was done by a journalist called Billy Kemba. Uh, and in fact, also in the spring of next year, there is going to be far more rigorous control of generic drug prices. Uh, and I anticipate that they will go down. And one of the companies making hydrocortisone is being taken to court. So there is a lot of activity in the society to try and remedy this. And lastly, Kareem and I have been writing to various members of the Houses of Parliament because the, dose of the price of thyroxine has just recently been announced to be doubling. And obviously that's going to uh, cause a huge amount of problems in, in our particular community and for the health service. So those are some things that we have been doing in the society. My point to Kareem, perhaps, is, or perhaps my question is, how many labs in the country can measure prednisolone? So, in fact, there are three. Um, ours is now on assay finders. So your lab can find it. If, if you ask for prednisolone level, um, routinely it can be done through assay finders. So that your lab will know about how to do it. Okay, any more burning questions? If not, I know time is pressing. What I'm going to give now is our speakers three minutes just to come back to any of the final points to sum up uh, to really convince you that you should vote for them. And what I say the voting is still open. I can see the, the swings or not as they, as, they, as, as they are occurring in real time. I would implore the 15% of you that are still undecided to nail your colours to the mast. I'm not going to come back to you and scrutinise how you voted, but... Um, Pick one or the other. That's what I would implore you. Okay, so, Kareem, do you want to sum up for us? Hello. Okay, just a couple of things, and that is, to those of you who say that we should use cortisol because it's the natural stuff, think about insulin, okay? We have used insulin, human, natural insulin. We don't do it anymore. We saw the molecule that's like lisinpro swapped over and long-chain fat is stuck to the side because the half-life is appropriate for the patient. And we need to alter the molecule to make it appropriate for the patient, okay? So while, while we say the natural substance we don't, wouldn't argue is the best, I mean, insulin natural isn't the best maybe because we want to have it once or twice a day. Similar to uh, prednisolone, you want to have it once a day. You don't want a person you need two or three times a day. So natural hormones are not necessarily uh, the most effective. The amount of evidence that, that the companies who make these new insulins have 
is simply that patients prefer to have two or three injections a day. They have no long-term data, and yet we've all switched over to the non-real insulin, okay? The agent I have is the same. That, that patient says, you know, I like three of prednisolone. That's great for me because you take once a day. That's the same level of evidence. There's lots of other substances where we use the analog. So, for example, in AVP, we wouldn't use AVP. We use DDAVP. That's completely artificial, similar to fluid recall design. The other thing is I've got several patients who switched over, and I say three milligrams because um, I had a patient once who basically had um, pemphigus and was a huge dose of prednisolone, 30, 20, all the time. And then he got acromegaly, and he had his pituitary sorted out and became hypopit. We never assessed his cortisol level because we thought he'd never come off prednisone. The dermatologist said he'll never come off it. He'll be on at least 10. So I thought, right, I'll leave that alone. And then a new treatment for pemphigus appeared after he was hypopit. So 10 years later, at a different skin hospital, they put on some monoclonal antibody, and they started to wean him off his prednisolone. And he went down to three, and he was fine. And then he took it down to two, and he was a bit unwell. And then he took it down to one, and he started vomiting. And he thought, I wonder if it's a prednisolone, he went back on it. And then about a month later, I saw him in clinic, he told me the story. And it seemed that for him, we got a level, and that kind of curve exactly is the same that you get with, with uh, prednisolone three milligrams. If you want to see be entertained, you must look at the endocrinology blog, endocrinology org blog about this debate. Um, there's a, there's a, someone from East Germany who's put a whole paragraph about how he's used prednisolone all his life. And uh, in the former East Germany, where they didn't have hydrocortisone, and all those patients don't want to switch over now that the iron curtains come down. So there's plenty of people around the world who use prednisolone as first-time therapy, and uh, we should do the same. Thank you. Stafford. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to be very sure. It is very easy to come up with anecdotal data. We, 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 all, we all have anecdotes of patients who say that what we do is fantastic and, and their life is so much better afterwards. But what's what is really important here uh, is that we know that even giving people the best possible replacement we can, there are major effects on mortality and morbidity. So if we're going to change to first line, remember this debate is about moving to first line replacement. If we dare do that on a treatment that we don't know, we don't know what the right dose is, we don't know whether or not it's safe, we don't know whether the relative distribution into the brain and the fat tissue is going to be appropriate, i.e. whether they'll get metabolic problems or they'll get a lack, they'll get a lack of memory problems or get memory problems. We, we just don't know anything about it. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a study, there shouldn't be a proper trial done, that's fine. I'd be very happy if there's a well-controlled trial done. But this is much too important for our patients that we have to know that this would be a safe treatment to give and that it would be effective. And at this stage, and the, the knowledge that we've got, it would not be correct for us to use this as first-line treatment. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much to our speakers, both for and against the, against the motion. If I can now ask you to make sure you get your smartphones out once again, there are still a, about 20 people in the audience out there somewhere who are still undecided. Make sure you get your final vote. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. We've got 411 votes so far. The results are looking very interesting, I have to, I, I have to say. So keep voting, keep voting. Um, and what we'll do in the next few seconds is stop the vote and then we will be able to um, uh, show you what the results are. So um, shall we um, call a halt to the voting there and um, if we can put the votes up on the screen that would be fantastic and I'll come up with some, uh, th some thoughts. Um, okay, so these are very, very interesting. And uh, let me refresh your memory of where we were at the start of the debate. So, yes, overall, we have thrown out the, um, thrown out the motion. So, overall, the House does not believe that prednisolone should be the first-line glucocorticoid replacement in adrenal insufficiency. However, at the start, 52% were against the motion, and now 60. So, 8% of the 8 of votes from the undecided. However, for the motion were 24%, and that's now increased by 13%. Up to, um, so basically, both have won, which I think is a fantastic result. <laughs> Excellent. Everyone indeed is a, is a winner. So thank you all very much for staying. Thank you to our speakers. It's been a fantastic debate. Thank you. Thank the chairman. <laughs>